ReZero, starting life in another world, is a lot smarter than some will give it credit for. On this channel, I've talked about the ways it deconstructs and reconstructs the tropes of its genre. I've talked about the way it deals with trauma and memory. But one thing I don't think gets discussed enough is the way it explores gender roles. ReZero isn't the kind of isekai series where the main character becomes super desirable and gets with each and every one of the perfect girls of his dreams. Instead, the story goes differently than expected for Natsuki Subaru. Surprisingly, most of the male characters are in roles subservient to women, and it's that setup that forces Subaru into situations where he has to rethink the way he views the women around him and his own masculinity. Natsuki Subaru is a divisive protagonist, but he's one I love because he's someone who grows and changes for the better. Throughout ReZero's narrative, Subaru has to discover what it means to be a good man by ceasing to view women as characters in his fantasies, abandoning his transactional view of relationships, and embracing his vulnerability instead of projecting a macho persona. On his own admission, Natsuki Subaru doesn't have much experience with the opposite sex. Hey, wow, I don't think I've been in one of these alone with a girl situations since I was in grade school. Suffice it to say, like a lot of boys his age, he developed his own beliefs and misconceptions about how women are, in part from the fiction he's consumed. He's a guy who proudly proclaims that men are about guts and women are about beauty, a very important phrase in this discussion. We'll swing back to that first part later, but for now, let's take a look at the latter half. When Natsuki Subaru arrives in this new world, he comes primed with expectations, both of himself and the world around him. ReZero being a fantasy story has a clever double meaning. The literal fantasy setting, a different world with magic and mythical creatures, and Subaru's personal fantasies, the desires and expectations he's built up in his head. Subaru immediately assumes he was summoned by a cute girl, and multiple times, he explicitly uses the word fantasy to describe women. She's even super cute when she's mad. That's another world's fantasy for you. Don't underestimate the capacity of my mind. You're both fair prey in my fantasies, little maids. Subaru has expectations for the women he encounters, particularly centered around their looks and their value to him, something he reiterates time and time again. What I'm trying to say is that a couple of cute girls like you and your sister ought to dress up and look nice both for yourselves and other people, you know? At least try to look as cute as I hoped you would! Don't talk like I'm just some doll! Like he said, women are about beauty. In addition to looking pretty, Subaru desires all the women around him fit into the archetypal damsel in distress that he can rescue. Just like with his expectations of being a traditional isekai hero, he's frustrated when his expectations of women clash with reality. It was supposed to be the classic scenario where I save a girl from hoodlums! When Subaru first meets these women, they're barely real people to him. They're characters, objects of fantasy to be desired and protected, whether they want it or not. That all sounds harsh, and it is, but I want to make it clear it doesn't come from a place of malice. He doesn't denigrate Amelia because she's a woman. In fact, he practically worships her, but that doesn't mean Subaru's views on women aren't misguided. Subaru builds up Amelia in his head as a perfect angel, the way any teenager with a crush would. But as the series progresses, we find out the harm in that mindset. Natsuki Subaru is a nice guy. He's a kind, empathetic person with strong morals, who will do whatever it takes to get the best outcome possible for the people he cares for. Unfortunately, he's also a nice guy. Capital N, capital G, trademark, nice guy. One of the crucial traits of a nice guy is that when it comes to romantic relationships, niceties aren't done out of altruism, but as a strategy to earn affection. Subaru, like a lot of young men, sees his relationship with women in a transactional way. This quid pro quo mindset crops up several times in his interactions with Amelia, where he continually insists on getting rewards for his deeds. Ah, your rescuer and the one who saved your life! And you are the heroine I saved from the clutches of evil! So wouldn't that mean you should repay me in kind, wouldn't it, huh? Though these exchanges may seem innocuous at first, they build up to a breaking point that reveals their insidious nature. 
At the royal selection ceremony, Subaru breaks his promise to Amelia to stay back and, instead, attends the meeting. He white knights Amelia by publicly lambasting the council and the royal guard, and then literally declares himself her knight. All of this without her approval. His criticisms of the nobility and their prejudices aren't necessarily untrue, but he caused a scene without any consideration for Amelia's feelings, despite apparently doing it for her. The ensuing argument with Amelia exposes Subaru's way of thinking and works on a couple different levels. When Amelia tells him, The version of me that lives within you must be amazing. It's both calling attention to how Subaru remembers Amelia for things she never actually did because of the different timelines, but it's also a condemnation of the way he idealizes her, and how the way he sees her is purely a fantasy of her, not the real Amelia. He claims all his actions have been for her sake, and when that doesn't work, we witness the ugly reality of Subaru's transactional approach to relationships. You are saved because I was there for you! Don't you see? You should have a greater debt to me than you could ever repay! Subaru believes because he saved her life, she owes him her companionship. He's trying to use his prior good deeds as a way to keep Amelia by his side, and it fails. When Subaru learns that Amelia may be in danger after she left him at the royal capital, he's excited because it gives him the opportunity to prove his worth to her. He views this life-threatening situation as his chance to show Amelia that she needs him. She needs me by her side. I know I can save her. Once I do, I'm sure she'll understand. She has to. Once again, Subaru is acting out of his own self-interests under the false belief that he can earn her affection by saving her. We see Subaru's behavior paralleled in the antagonist of the arc, the Sin Archbishop of Sloth, Petalgeus Romani Conti. Petalgeus is obsessed with the Witch of Envy, a half-elf named Satella that the story draws deliberate connections to Amelia. Petalgeus's actions are all apparently in the name of love for this half-elf, but when the two meet face to face, she rejects him. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? However, while Petalgeus continues his mindless devotion to Satella claiming love is the reason, even after the rejection, Subaru comes to terms with the selfishness in his actions, rectifies it, and apologizes to Amelia. I said it was all for you, but I really just liked the idea of doing it all for you. Subaru and Amelia only share their first kiss after he finally recognizes that she's her own person not a perfect angel, not an archetype of a fantasy girl, but a real human being with her own shortcomings and anxieties, and loves her despite that. Subaru's prior behavior comes as a result of his feelings of inadequacy. He projects his powerlessness onto Amelia. This is his way of coping because if he can't be her protector, then he feels like he's failed as a man by the standards he set up for himself. After all, men are about guts and women are about beauty, right? Subaru feels emasculated. The women around him are stronger and more capable than him, and he's not the desirable man he assumed he would be upon entering this new world. Even after securing a victory and living in a mansion with attractive girls, he's made to feel insecure about his status as a man. It's perfectly embodied in the bath scene where Roswell, the patriarch of the manor, literally flaunts his penis right in front of Subaru's face and calls him his property. And if that isn't obvious enough, he walks out naked only to have his own penis insulted by one of the maids he found attractive. Would you mind covering up that sorry thing? <laughs> if that isn't a textbook example of how to show a character is emasculated, then I don't know what is. Subaru is jealous and intimidated by the men around him, who better embody the traits he expects from himself. Men like the knight Julius. His rivalry with Julius is based on male ego and jealousy that Julius will take Amelia away from him, despite not being with him romantically in the first place. Subaru wants to be the kind of guy that takes charge and acts as the protector. And we see that paralleled with Wilhelm, the sword devil. Young Wilhelm is a cold killing machine, the kind of guy that says he hates flowers. He makes it his mission to shoulder the burdens of the woman he loves. The difference here is that unlike Amelia, 
Teresia does want to be relieved of the burden of having to fight, but Wilhelm is still so emotionally distant he can't even tell her he loves her, and lives in regret because of it following her death. But no matter what he sometimes projects, Subaru is so much softer than that. He fits strangely well in women's clothing, he's very skilled at sewing, and he certainly doesn't hate flowers. His softer, more traditionally feminine traits tend to be the ones that actually endear him to people. Subaru consistently finds himself in situations where he learns it's advantageous to ditch the macho persona he tries to put on that doesn't really suit him anyway, and show his vulnerability. Enough of that weird tough act. He starts off believing that men are about guts, but learns that this prideful and impulsive approach makes things worse more than it makes things better. He needs to succeed by being clever, respectful, and emotionally honest. At the sanctuary, Subaru tries to shoulder everyone's burdens, including taking the trials on Amelia's behalf, robbing her of her own agency. Throughout the course of ReZero's story, Subaru has to accept that he's not particularly powerful physically, or the traditionally masculine hero he expected to be, and learn that his role is to stand beside Amelia, not in front of her. The people you want to protect aren't just the ones behind you, and I believe Miss Amelia is a lot more capable than you think. ReZero's fantasy world forces Natsuki Subaru to confront his own fantasies. The large female cast almost makes it feel like exposure therapy for Subaru, who now has the opportunity to work through his views on women and his masculinity. I'm very excited for Season 3, where discussions of the way the series deftly explores gender roles can continue, largely because of the contrast between Subaru and a certain other character, but we'll cross that bridge when we get there. If you have any suggestions for other ReZero videos you'd like to see in the lead up to the third season, be sure to let me know down below. Consider subscribing to the channel, and if you'd like to support me directly, check out my Patreon. Thanks for watching.